<clears throat> Last week we dealt with a series of naturally occurring resources that were to guide us in this quest for wisdom and for right living. Um, and the strongest one was the last, which was enjoyment. And it wasn't enjoyment so much as a stimulation of pleasure, but it was a, a deeper kind of enjoyment of grasping the significance of the smallest good things that we experience in our lives. However, being the teacher of Ecclesiastes, the teacher was insistent that we kind of hold that enjoyment with a recognition that even the capacity to enjoy is a God-given gift. So we were still kind of caught in this web of, well, how are we to live? What are we to think? What are we to do? So although we had a fairly positive lesson last week, we're going to go back again this week and go into futility and absurdity for one chapter, for the sixth chapter. The seventh chapter, and if you think there are uh, 12 or 13, there are 12 chapters, we're right at the midpoint. So the sixth chapter is dark again. The seventh begins to show some light. And that's, that's where we're headed today. So our goals for today are Again, to stay with this issue of futility and injustice in how um, people are motivated to live a good life. We're going to recognize that we're at the midpoint, and he literally puts together those two voices that he's struggling with, the all is vanity voice, and it is better to enjoy the gift of life voice. He's going to put them side by side on the table. Um, he is going to offer us seven goods. It is a good thing to do this. It is a good to do that. And maybe some of you remember from other Old Testament uh, studies that seven is ordinarily the number of perfection. Completeness. That's all you need in this. So we are going to get seven goods. Mm -hmm. And at the end, there will be an affirmation of the wise life and an interesting way that we can see wisdom on the face of one another. Okay? Last week I opened it with my personal frustration over trying to, to delve into Ecclesiastes. Um, today I also have some frustration, but it comes from a different place. So. Um, whereas last week we were working on the justice injustice, this one today, having just announced that difficult prayer concern before, says with the book of Job, Job's big affirmation was, should we not also receive evil from the hand of God? as we receive good. Job's friends, remember Job's friends, and the whole thing is set up to say, Job, if you would just confess your sins, then God would forgive you and everything would be okay. And Job continually says, I haven't sinned. That's not, that's not who I am. I am a faithful person. I trust wholeheartedly in God. And his friends come to him. At the very beginning, his wife, who's so frustrated with him, looks him in the eye and said, curse God and die and get it over with Job. You're prolonging this suffering for everybody. And that's when he looks her back in the eye and says, should we only receive good from the hand of God and not also receive evil? Um, and this is where our teacher today will eventually come down. He, our teacher will eventually, by the time we get to the end of the lesson, be able to say, there is good 
and there is evil, and somehow God is managing all of that. Okay? It's not an easy path that we try. So we're going to start. I will read chapter 6, 1 through 12, and my sub subheading on the commentary that I'm using is called A Lowering of Expectations. <laughs> okay. So chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy upon mankind. Those to whom God gives wealth, possession, and honor, so that they lack nothing of all that they desire. Yet God does not enjoy, enable them to enjoy these things, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. It's a grievous ill. A man may beget a hundred children and live many days, but however many are the days of his years, he does not enjoy life's good things or paths no burial. I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For the stillborn comes into vanity and, go, and goes into darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun or known anything, it, yet it finds rest rather than he, meaning the rich man. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to perform the same place. Verse 7. All human toil is for the mouth. Yet appreciation is not satisfied, appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage have the wise over fools? And what do the poor have who know how to conduct themselves before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes, better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of desire. But this also is vanity and a chasing after the Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what human beings are, and that they are not able to dispute with those who are stronger. The more words, the more vanity. So how is one the better? For who knows what is good for mortals, while they live the few days of their vain life, which they pass by the shadow? Who can tell them what will be after them, after them under the sun? So we had just finished at chapter five with an affirmation of the good gifts of life that come from God uh, and the capacity to enjoy those gifts. But now the the teacher basically looks at the sort of four traditional stages of life, which is birth. Um, childhood really is a mistake, but birth and childhood, marriage and children, um, work and prosperity, death and remembrance. So those are the sort of four ways that life is viewed in this traditional culture. You're born married and you have children, and you know, if you're born, you may not make it to stage of marriage. When you're married, you may not have children. Um, you work, you may not be successful, you may be. And then you die, and one of the blessings of a life, quote, well lived, is a good burial, which is a way of saying, So the teacher reveals that he is actually almost driven to despair by what he has seen as attached to these four stages. And he starts by looking at the wealthy man who has not the gift to enjoy his wealth. And he, he roughly he says, this is sort of my just observation. 
combination of the unfairness of life. To have all of these material possessions and have no joy. This feels horribly unfair. Then he states that, well, even without that, what if a person just lived a really, really long life, had many, many children, maybe didn't have much joy in life, but at the end, if he had a good burial, would that make up for anything? Hmm. And again, he says no. Better to be a still part. Better to have come from darkness, return to darkness without ever having seen the light of day. And then he had perfect rest. Because the wealthy man who has lived all these years of striving and toiling has not had rest. So he, ex he proposes that, which is a, a substrain in some of the other wisdom writings as well, better not to have lived than to have lived an unfortunate toil some life. He goes back and he says, well, let's look at something a little more easy, easy to understand. What about the appetites of life? Our <coughs> desires for pleasure, the, the taste of good food, the sound of good music. And he says, you know, we really have more desire than we have the capacity to fulfill those desires. And the desires seem to add and add more and more. And I couldn't help but what was a subtext of that for me in our contemporary world is addiction. But unless we understand addiction as a spiritual problem, it never gets solved. Because addiction is this, I can't feed myself enough. I need more, I need more, I need more. And the more that we actually all need is the contentment and the rest in God. So he concludes with um, wondering about, and this will be the, the tone of the next chapter, wondering, is there really an advantage for wisdom? Does it really help that Martha, with her realistic perspective on life, can find an equilibrium? Is that possible? Or is the fool on the street corner who wants nothing more than another uh, hamburger to eat. Uh, it, is he in the same circumstance as Martin? So it, he, he offers that up as a question at the end. Um, he uses the last two verses as kind of a transitional unity, unit that focuses on the impossibility of knowing what's truly going on in the world. For who knows what is good for while they live a few days of their vain life, which they pass like a shadow, who can tell them what will come after from under the sun? The teacher has reached his intellectual limits, and of course, he is still saying vanity. It's futile, it's absurd, it makes no sense. Seven, verse one through fourteen. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for this is the end of everyone, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness, the countenance <coughs> of the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For like the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of fools. This also is vanity. 
Surely oppression makes the wise foolish, but a corrupt, but a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. The patient in spirit are better than the proud in spirit. Do not be angry, for anger larges in the bosom of fools. Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is as good as an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to the one who possesses it. Consider the work of God. <coughs> Who can make straight what God has made crooked? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God has made the one as well as the other, so that mortals may not find out anything that will come after them. In the midst of the overwhelming evidence of absurdity, of vanity, of utility in the last chapter, the teacher suddenly turns to the midpoint of his composition, <coughs> with the last word being frustration without understanding of anything that's good for humankind. Now the second half of the book opens with a good name. And it feels like whiplash. This is so different from what we've had. So although no absolute good or perfect attainment is, um, is illustrated, he does offer certain good behaviors that the wise individual should cultivate. Good ways of being in the world. Although, None of these come with guarantees because, of course, that would be what? Vanity. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and everything is set within this limitation that we cannot completely understand why God acts as God acts. So here are the seven things. Bit by bit, we'll go along and we'll look at the way we So for the first number one is the first one, which is a good name. I, we have not talked about it too much in this study, but in other Old Testament studies, we have talked about the importance of honor in that society and to have a good name. Uh, a name worthy of being remembered was the highest prize that a person could have. Um, there's an interesting poetic twi twist here because a good name uh, is better than precious ointment and the day of death better than the day of birth. What's, what's sweet there is anointing with oil happens at birth and at death. The death anointing is more important because there has been the life in between it. A complete reversal from what he just said about better to be born, a stillborn, you know? <laughs> so he's completely reversing here and saying, no, at the moment of death, there is something important, and that is your good name. All right, continuing on to number two. Good number two <coughs> has to do with participating in mourning. Well, so here's the circumstance. If you die in his culture, your family and friends will gather and stay together for seven days. Remember seven, complete. And you will eat and you will remember, but you will keep your words to a minimum. And there'll be some professional mourners there who will keep the songs and the wails going. Uh, and you will say your prayers in the morning and in the evening <coughs> together. And then at the end of that time, 
you're dismissed to return to your line. What our author is saying is in that seven day period of mourning, if you are taking this seriously, you're cultivating a heart that's able to accept both the difficulties of life as well as the joys of life. If you just go to the party time, you'll begin to think that that's all that life is, a series of parties. But if you want to be wise, you, it's better to spend some time mourning. So that's the second goal. The third goal is really hard for me because I'm basically a cheerful person. But the third goal is a sad face is preferable. Now, what does that mean? Well, it probably means more a neutral face than a sad face. But so that when you are always walking in, as I frequently do, to a group happy, the one or two or three or four people who are in a completely different place don't have access to you. In fact, they're probably intimidated and irritated by your cheerfulness. So if you're going to live in community, there's a time when everybody's joyful together, but basically you need to be somewhat neutral so that wherever the person is who's approaching you, that person finds a welcome in you. I don't want to be grim, uh, but you don't want to be, you know, too superficially cheerful either. So that's that's his. Um, he, he doesn't. He sees this sad face as expanding the capacity for compassion rather than projecting pessimism. You know, the sad face opens up the door for what might be difficult conversations. The fourth goal, you know, five and six, seems to refer to the distinguishing between meaningful and insincere praise. And this is done poetically so wonderfully when we don't have any of it in, in our English translation. But that second section, um, the song of fools is the word for song is seer. The thorns that crackle under the pot are serum, and the pot is sir. And so you have this alliteration of sounds that paints a picture of what insincere praise is like. So it's a nice poetic thing that goes over our heads completely. All right, so just don't worry about that second part of the verse. Um, the fifth good is cautionary. The best pers perspective one can hope to attain is, attain on any given matter is really known in its outcome. So, Carmen and I sit down and we work out a service of worship that we think is absolutely perfect, right? We're just so pleased with ourselves. But until that service actually happens, we don't know whether we should be pleased or not. So it encourages a kind of patience for the plans and the hopes and the dreams that we pursue. Don't just plan and hope it all comes out. Walk through it. Be patient with it. See what, what the end is really coming to be. Um, the easy out is always to get angry. A quick temper is what he's trying to caution against. Remember, he's dealing with younger men, right? Okay, good. The sixth good is um, it's confusing. So it seems to say, wisdom's good, but you know, money's kind of good too. And how do wisdom and money or making a good living work together? 
And I think, again, speaking to young people, he's also saying it's not enough just to sit around and think. You should be engaged in some meaningful work. Because when you're engaged in meaningful toil, then your thoughts can't be just escaping into the air. They have to somehow be coherent with what you're actually doing. And then the seventh good, which is really the high point of today's teaching, in trying to understand the work of God, wisdom brings a kind of an acceptance into life. So rather, as Toby was saying, rather than struggling against God's word and God's will, the wise one chooses the good, which is to be joyful in the good times and to be thoughtful, prayerful, deeply meditative in the difficult times. And that's the best good that he has to recommend. At chapter 7, beginning at 15 and going to 29, 28. I'm saving 29. In my vain life, I have seen everything. There are righteous people who perish in their righteousness. There are wicked people who prolong their life and their evil doing. Do not be too righteous and do not act too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be too wicked. Do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It is good that you should take hold of the one without letting go of the other. For the one who fears God shall succeed with both. <clears throat> Wisdom gives strength to the wise, more than ten rulers that are in the city. Surely there is no one on earth so righteous as to do good without ever sinning. Do not give heed to everything that people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. <laughs> your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. All this I have tested by wisdom, and I said, I will be wise, but it was far from me. That which is, is far off and deep, very deep, who can find it? I turned my mind to know and to search out and to seek wisdom and the sum of things and to know that wickedness is folly and that foolishness is madness. I find more bitter than death. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a trap, whose heart is snares and nets, whose hands are fetters. One who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken in by her. <clears throat> See, this is what I found, says the teacher, adding up what I, uh, adding one thing to another to find the sum, which my mind has sought repeatedly, but I have not found. One man among a thousand I found, but not a woman among all of these have I found. Let's stop for a minute. Let me give you some background. <laughs> Again, the teacher is facing this common expectation that if you're good and righteous, you should have a lovely, pleasant life, and if you're a sinner and a fool, you should die today. He's arguing against that kind of retribution retributive justice because he's seen in his own experience that sometimes the fools live long and sometimes the righteous die early. So he's, he's offering a moderate position through that. He's saying recognize your own foolishness, your own vanity, your own sinfulness. Hold that carefully, because that can become a teacher for you. Recognize and pursue the good that you know, the behaviors that you can cultivate, 
the thoughts that can take you right to the edge of understanding where in humility you'll say something like, it's in God's hands. It's greater than my mind can imagine. He is convinced as Paul in the New Testament that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there is no perfection when it comes to humankind. So if all have sinned, then you have to take seriously your sinning. And it may not be overt sinning. It could be the collateral damage done by your good deed. The unintended harm. And yet, it clings to you. And you need to sit with that and learn from that. Now, all this stuff about women, right? <laughs> so, in the first place, man, let me just notice that one in a thousand is not a great lot, right? So one in a thousand, you know, when you're dealing with a population, that the only time that they would see more than 50 or 100 people is when they went to Jerusalem and saw a big religious celebration. So, one in a thousand are unlikely odds. Women, without the advantage of education, without the advantage of a life outside the home, <laughs> there's no way that any of them are going to be able to live a good life from a male perspective. And then remember again, who's he teaching? Hormone-driven young men. And what does he need to say to them? Do not go after every pretty skirt. <laughs> really, do not do that. There's something a bit more in life that you will discern, but if you get entrapped in your lustiness, that's gonna be a dangerous entrapment. So don't get too over, this is not a statement saying that women are all doomed to hell. It's just another way of saying none of us male nor female, attain this kind of perfection that some people assume they want to attain. So his, his suggestion is pursue the good and be respectful of the evil you do. Uh, really try to understand that and let that become a cautionary uh, response within you. two verses, uh, the last verse of chapter 7 and the first of chapter 8. See, this alone I found, that God made human beings straightforward, but they have devised many schemes. Who is like the wise man? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? Wisdom makes one's face shine, and the hardness of one's countenance is changed. In this conclusion, there is the return to the rhetorical question about what advantage is there to, in seeking wisdom in becoming wise. And he says two things. One is that you're created straightforward. Who else has a different translation of straightforward? That's in the first, the last verse of seven. God made human beings upright. 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 upright, straightforward. God made us to be good. We, by putting ourselves in the place of God, have allowed a kind of a quirkiness about us so that being good is corrupted by the quirkiness of sins. Mm -hmm. So theologically, you would talk about that in terms of original sin, but practically it is we all have passions and lusts and appetites and 
senses of self-importance and grasping and all of that, whereas God created us not to grasp, but to, to live together, to walk side by side, to help one another. Then he says, at the beginning of A, who's like the wise man, and he suggests this word, interpretation, who knows the interpretation of a thing? And I think that is the statement of being at the boundary of almost understanding and reaching for an interpretation that will take you across that boundary. It could be a metaphor, it could be a story, it could be a creed, something that will take you beyond the limits of your own understanding. What is interesting is when this book is written, remember we said that it is the second most recent to the New Testament in the Old Testament, right? So Daniel is the only word that is closer to the time of Jesus. Daniel has many sections with uh, Aramaic in it instead of just Hebrew. And this word interpretation um, comes from the Hebrew word pesha. And pesha, it's the only occurrence of it outside of Daniel in the Old Testament. It is also a very, very important word in the Qumran community and the Dead Sea Scrolls. So what your interpretation is a new category of thought that hasn't been part. Uh, we think of interpretation of the scriptures all the time. That's, that's what we do. That's what we've been doing today. We've been interpreting this. But up to this point, People were not interpreting. They were reciting. It's the difference between the approach to the Quran and the approach to scripture. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Quran is meant to be heard. It's meant to be beautiful on your ear in Aramaic. In Arabic. It's not meant to be interpreted. It's meant to provoke a mystical response. Our scriptures, we have decided they are worthy of interpretation, and that's the first little hint in Old Testament of a new stream, which Jesus will. You have heard it said of old, but I say to you, there's going to be an interpretation. Now, what is the advantage of being wise? Your face shines. <laughs> that's going like why would I want that? <laughs> but it's a it's a re remembrance of in a Numbers six when God gives to Moses an instruction for Aaron on how the people are to be blessed. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His countenance to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And then God says, this is how the priests of God shall put God's name upon the Israelites. And God will bless them indeed. So your very face will become a reflection of the countenance of God. Not a bad blessing. Not a bad blessing. May it be so among us. <laughs>